there. Thank you so much for tuning in to this message from Mission Church. We hope that this helps you in your journey in finding and following Christ. As always, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube or to our podcast. And if you're in the area, we would love to meet you at 82 Stratford Drive on a Sunday morning. And for now, let's tune in to this message from Summer on the Mount. If I haven't met you yet, as Alex mentioned, my name is Dan Root. I'm one of the pastors here, and she said it. This is week seven of this series, the summer series we've been in, called Summer on the Mount. And what we've been doing over these weeks is we've been looking at one of the most important sermons ever given, a sermon Jesus gives called the Sermon on the Mount. And we're really just looking at his introduction over these eight weeks to this sermon, just the intro is this part called the Beatitudes. Say that word with me, the Beatitudes. Yeah, it's a big word. Uh, What this word means is simply a series of blessings. That's what it means. And so what Jesus is doing in these Beatitudes is he's stringing together a total of eight blessings to explain what life is like as a follower of Jesus in his kingdom. Now now remember, this isn't like how to achieve salvation. No, no, no. It's an illustration for what it looks like to be happy, to be a blessed person as a follower of Jesus. And so if you've missed any of these weeks, I'd encourage you to go back and watch them. But it all began with this radical blessing Jesus made. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those that have nothing and can do nothing, because the kingdom of God is for that person. And blessed are those who mourn their sin, because comfort's going to come really quick. And then blessed are the meek. We no longer walk around powering up on people. No, it's strength under control. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who desire right living and right standing with God. Oh, Jesus promises to fill them. And then when you're filled, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And as we heard last week, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And so today's is actually incredibly timely. And so I'm going to pull it up. Here's the seventh beatitude, Matthew 5, 9. Read the bold word with me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus says, happy. Ready? The happiest people. They're the peacemakers. Does anyone today want peace? Does anyone feel like there's a supply chain shortage of peace? It's like there is a surplus of conflict and a shortage of peace. Is peace even possible? Let's be honest. Is peace just totally a pipe dream? It's like conflict is everywhere. I don't know if you felt this everywhere, even when you're not looking for it. Grace, my wife, was um, at Woodman's over here this week, filling up on gas. Oh, their gas prices are the best, but it's like the Wild West. That should be their slogan. It's like madness over there. It's like, just get to a pump. It's crazy. And so uh, Grace, she, she pulls up to the pump with, you know, the, the tank on the side of her fuel tank, the pump lines, and she's pulling up, and this pickup truck comes from the opposite direction and kind of, like, beats her to it. And so, you know, my wife is patient, so she's just like, okay, like, kind of just pauses, you know, waves the person in. And so this pickup truck drives up, and so they're windshield to windshield. And my wife, Grace, is, like, thoughtful. She's like, well, they're going to need to pull out and drive, so I'll just leave some space. So she's just sitting there waiting when all of a sudden there's just this commotion out of the corner of her eye. And she sees and hears this kind of banged up Honda SUV and she notices it's got dents and dings and it's missing a bumper and it comes driving up, like driving, flies up through that gap, just misses Grace's car and dings the pickup truck. And the lady who's fueling up at the pickup truck, she hops out and she's like, stop, everybody, what are you doing? You can imagine what she starts screaming at this person, and everybody's getting gassed. They're just like, what? And my wife is like, what in the world just happened? 
like total chaos and conflict from out of nowhere. And the SUV just took off and kept driving. And I wonder if you've had like weeks like that where everyone just kind of looks at each other and they're like, what in the world was that about? Have you been feeling this? It feels like conflict shows up even when we're not looking for it, but it especially shows up when we are looking for it. Where's the peace, really? Now, maybe you're wondering that as a student today, dealing with cliques of friends or cliques for approval, you're like, where's the peace? Or as a 20-something, you're wondering if the world has just totally lost it. You're like, hashtag van, van life. I'm just going to go live in a van by the river. You're all crazy. Or maybe you're a parent fighting battles you never saw coming between policies and politics. Or a grandparent restless at the choices you see others making around you. There seems to be a surplus of conflict and a shortage of peace. But Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. I want some peace. Now, I know what may be happening when we start to talk about peace for some of you is like if your brain has eyes, you just roll them. You're like, oh, this is the peace, kumbaya one. Got it. He's going to quote a little, give peace a chance, John Lennon, maybe throw a little John Mayer, just wait on the world to change. No, come on. No, nope. peacemaking isn't that simple. In this life, you will have trouble. Jesus promises it to you. You will have conflict. You will feel tension. Tension is unavoidable. We cannot escape tension in this life. So our question today, when it comes to peacemaking, is not, are you relieving tension as a peacemaker? That's not it. It's, are you holding the right tension as a peacemaker? See, I found peace often plummets when two things become brittle. Peace just nosedives when two things become brittle. Relationships and rights. Relationships and rights. Peace plummets when relationships become unhinged. And peace plummets when rights become infringed. You notice this? And it rhymes, so it's gotta be true. Peace plummets when relationships become unhinged, and peace plummets when rights become infringed. And here's what happens. Intention, when relationships become unhinged and rights start to get infringed, people like you and I, we want to keep the peace. But we feel ourselves at odds and fearful of losing the relationship or our right. But you want peace? I know you do. I know I do. In fact, most people want peace. So here's what we can tend to try to do to keep the peace when there's conflict. Uh, we can embody these two ways. Maybe you've done this, or probably not you, probably the person next to you. We can embody one of these two things. First, we can embody the warrior. Yeah. The warrior demands peace. They tend to favor their rights. The warrior will come out and say things like, hey, what gives you the right? Yeah, what gives you the right? Don't you dare infringe on my rights. This is what the, this is what the warrior does. They demand peace. And it doesn't matter what side of the conflict you're on. We can tend to embody the warrior and demand peace. And I get this, because we want peace. But going rogue warrior or like Beastie Boy to fight for your right to party, that isn't peacemaking. The warrior might win the battle, but it doesn't bring the blessing. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Or, or maybe you're not embodying the warrior. Maybe you can embody the avoider. This is what I tend to do. The avoider defers peace. The warrior demands peace, the avoider, like, defers peace. They tend to be focused more on the relationship. 
They're like, look, it's just, it's easier to run and hide. It's, it's easier to give in and for you to just have your way so as not to disrupt this relationship. And the avoider, they might avoid the battle, but it also doesn't bring the blessing. And perhaps right now, if you're a warrior in the room, you're thinking, so what, Dan, what? I'm just supposed to sit here and ignore it? Be taken advantage of? Not on my watch. And the avoiders are thinking like, so what? What do you want me to do? Stand up to them and have a backbone? Do you know how bad that's going to make it? So much worse. But no, neither one of those things. At least not like you'd think. Being a peacemaker is not acting like a warrior or acting like an avoider. It's something so much more noble. So much more distinct that it actually makes you look like you're one of God's kids. This is why Jesus includes it in this string of blessings. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. People are going to look and go, that's one of God's kids, clearly. Jesus is saying there is a higher way. There's a way that makes you look like your family. There's a way that makes you look like your mind. So what is this way of the peacemaker? Well, here's the deal. This word peacemaker, this is literally the only place in the entire Bible this word is used. So this one word, it actually means two things at once. This one word conveys two things at once. And we have some words in the English language that work like this. So I thought, let's have a little fun with this to make the point. Um, so here's one. One word that conveys two things. First, uh, rom-com. Rom-com. What is this? This is romance and comedy. It's the best of both worlds. We love a good rom-com. Or uh, how about this one? Staycation. Yeah, it is stay and vacation. And with some of these gas prices, you're like, no, hey, staycation this year. We are staying and having a vacation. It's the best of both worlds. Or how about this one, my personal favorite? Athleisure. It is both athletic and leisure. I might run a marathon, I might take a nap. You never know what I'm going to be doing. One word conveys two things. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, they're like, oh, he just said two things at once. Peacemaker. It is not fighting and full flourishing. Peacemaker, not fighting, like not having conflict, and full flourishing, like you can feel the kingdom of God. It's the absence of something bad and the presence of something better. But so often, as peacemakers, we just kind of want to undo the bad, but we often forget about the flourishing. Peacemaking involves both. So if you don't hear anything else I say today, lock this away. Peacemaking is declaring good news over debating bad news. This is what peacemaking is. It's actually a higher way. It's declaring good news over debating bad news. Peacemaking is more about pulling down than it is pulling together. Pulling down, like when Jesus says, on earth as it is in heaven, a peacemaker declares God's good news that makes people, on whatever side of a conflict they are on, whole, more than simply addressing the conflict so one side or the other feels good that you know what they're talking about. It's not what peacemaking is. Peacemaking is more about pulling down than it is pulling together. It is declaring good news over simply debating bad news. What if peacemaking looked more like declaring good news in your life and mine than debating bad news? Imagine the hope and healing. Imagine our volume of worship in here. 
Imagine the intensity of prayer. Imagine the attraction of people when they encounter you as a peacemaker or a gathering of peacemakers. Now, for the warriors in here, perhaps you're getting a little nervous thinking this peacemaking stuff is a slippery slope toward defeat. Um, Remember who rules the kingdom you say you're a part of. He's called the Prince of Peace. He's got it. And if you're an avoider that can kind of embody that like me, maybe you're thinking like, phew, okay, good. I don't have to engage. Well, good news doesn't declare itself. It needs you. So you're in it too. And if all this peacemaking stuff, it sounds soft to you, just get ready. Because as you live as a peacemaker, as you peacemake, if that were a word, you, you will find out the camps on opposite sides of a conflict actually have one thing in common. You're the problem. So stay tuned for next week. There's a blessing about that. This is crazy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So how can we declare good news over debating bad news? As I said, this word, peacemaker, it only occurs one time in the Bible. But there's one other place where the function of this word, like what it looks like, is expressed. And it's in the book of Acts. It's a tense conflict involving relationships and rights exactly where peace plummets. It involves this guy named Paul. He used to be called Saul. Saul was a fiercely religious Jewish man, so much so that he would kill Christians just to preserve his Jewish religious roots. But Saul, if you know the story, he encounters the Prince of Peace on this road to kill a bunch of Christians. And his life does a 180 after encountering Jesus. And this created some conflict, some relationship tension to put it lightly. But his life is completely completely changed. He ends up not killing Christians, but declaring good news, expanding the early church, writing the majority of the New Testament of the Bible that we need and read. So what happens is his relationships are like Saul with your your new name, Paul. Mm Mm-mm. We're not having it. And you're making things become unhinged. And we want you dead. So Paul finds himself in the middle of court, sandwiched right in the middle of a conflict between his relationships that he used to have and his rights as a Roman citizen. So he stands in the middle between his relationships and his rights, and he feels the pull and tension of reconciliation and peacemaking. And then he steps to the mic and they go, Paul, the floor is yours. What do you have to say? And Paul doesn't go warrior and Paul doesn't go avoider. He declares good news over debating bad news. He talks about his personal experience. He doesn't point fingers. He talks about, get this, his encounter with Jesus. He's like, you know what? I was a fervent religious Jewish man. All these people, all these relationships that put me in court here today, these were my friends. They can tell you how strict I was about my religion, how I killed for what we believed. They were soft compared to me. And they've put me here today for one thing and one thing only, because of a hope that I have found in the resurrected person of Jesus. And I just keep talking about one thing, one thing, the resurrection hope that I have in Jesus. And he tells the court and the king of how he encountered Jesus, how his eyes were blinded and then his sight restored, how his mind was changed and his motivation found a brand new direction, how he doesn't live in darkness anymore, but he's a child who lives in the light, that there's a living hope for this life right now and for the next because of one thing, the resurrection of Jesus. He declares how he's been saved and sent, 
set apart as a follower of Jesus, a reconciler because of the resurrection. This is his bullseye. That's it. In conflict, he doesn't anchor into his relationships. When the tension is felt, he doesn't dig in his heels into his rights. He declares good news instead of debating bad news. He pulls down the kingdom more than simply pulling together at the conflict. And to both the crowd and the king, he elevates this whole thing to the higher way that's way above their expectations. He's like, hey, to the one corner of the relationships, I'm going to keep talking about one thing, the resurrection hope of Jesus. So if you want to kill me, I don't know what to tell you because I answer to the resurrected king. And to the court, I have rights as a Roman citizen, so whatever process you got to do for me, I'm going to keep talking about one thing. And whatever courtroom you put me in and whenever you give me the mic, I'm going to use my time to talk about one thing, the hope we have in the resurrected Jesus. Thank, I love that the 11 of you are aligned with this. <laughs> Peacemakers. They don't anchor in relationships. Peacemakers don't anchor in rights. Peacemakers anchor in the resurrection. Center bullseye. Where have you been anchoring? And I ask that because I'm with you and I drift. Are you needing a relationship or a, a tribe to be everything you need it to be to hold you together? Are you feeling like you need a right to be intact, to hold you together? Peacemakers, they don't anchor in their relationships. They don't anchor in their lives and their rights. They anchor in the resurrection. They live resurrection lives. Now, that does not mean we don't honor our relationships. And that does not mean we don't honor our rights. That's what it looks like to love well. Remember meek week. We don't go, well, forget about you on all sides. No, nah, come on. Remember our rescue. Because when we live resurrection lives like this, a higher way, it is so freeing. Because when Paul's relationships there in the courtroom become unhinged, and his friends are like, hey, and they probably still call them Saul, just to like, hey, I remember you. I know what you did. You're not worthy of it. You are worse than all of us. And they start casting shame and throwing all this stuff at him. He's like, you know what? You're right. I'm not pretending to be better than you. I'm expressing I'm forgiven. It's why this forgiveness and living hope thing that I have is so important to me. And when it comes to his rights, when his legal counsel's like, hey, how, how do you want to play this? Like your rights are being infringed. He's like, um, I'm just going to keep talking about the resurrection and the hope that I have. That's my bullseye. Paul detaches from both camps, and he attaches to the cross. So much so that in a different part of the Bible, Paul says, it's Christ who lives in me. He's like, religion? Uh, I answer to the resurrected king. Rights? I honor those, but this is above your pay grade. I answer to the resurrected king. So like, I'll go through your system, and whatever step you put me in, I'm going to reason for the resurrection. If you want to kill me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. There's rewards in heaven. And everybody in both camps are just like, we don't know what to do with this guy. Paul's peacemaking is not the merging of his two worlds, but the promoting of a peace that transcends both worlds. It's the resurrection, a living hope. And there's reconciliation and peace for all because of this death and resurrection. Peacemaking is way more about pulling down than pulling together. So what tension have you been holding? Now, here, let's be clear. As we declare good news over debating bad news, here's the caveat. The peacemaker, you and I, we're actually to look like the prince of peace. Remember, they go, oh, that's one of God's kids. So, how can we peacemake well? 
I want to give us three super helpful handles to help us be peacemakers. All right, here's the first one. If you're, if you, if you're interested in taking notes, now's the time. Peacemakers go first. Peacemakers initiate. They go first. Whether you are the offended or the offender, peacemakers go first. Remember, you're not a warrior. You're not an avoider. You're a peacemaker. Conflict never resolves itself. Time doesn't heal all wounds. It doesn't. Resentment over time is like you drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It does not work. Peacemakers go first. And even right now, as God is revealing that relationship, that face, the tension, getting like stiff, a little sweaty, starting to feel some things. So let's just go into it with our eyes wide open. When, when you go first as a peacemaker, fear will exist. Fear will exist. So here's the pro tip about going first, because fear will exist. Pro tip, plan your fear. Plan it out. The only thing worse than encountering fear is not knowing when you're going to encounter fear. When it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and my little girl Elliot in full daylight goes, boo, I'm like, ah. When it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I get up to go to the bathroom and she's got that crazy hair and that nightgown and she's like, dad, I'm like, ah, and I like lose it. Oh. Fear will exist. Pro tip, plan your fear. Think about, when's the right time? What's the right tone? Don't be reactive in this, in going first. Be proactive. Plan your fear. Fear will exist. And take heart, because the courage of the Spirit exceeds that fear. 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love drives out fear. So as you're going first, plan it out. What's the right timing? What's the right tone? And then pray for courage from the Spirit. Ask for wisdom. He promises to give it when you ask. Receive God's love. Peacemakers, go first. Then, fight fair. Peacemakers, go first. Peacemakers, fight fair. Start with what is my fault. Use I and me language. Not you or why. This is why when Paul gets the mic, he's like, I was this way. I encountered the resurrected king. I have experienced a hope and a joy. So what can this look like? Well, when my parents came over for the weekend, you know, we talked about it and I had the expectation that I would have time with them. And it was just kind of chaotic and I didn't have the time with them. And so I felt like that was a missed opportunity between us. And I felt then unseen and I felt unvalued. And I feel like there's tension between us and that's making me feel unloved. I me language. It's not, I'm feeling sad because you're an idiot. And you always mess up and this happens every single time our parents, see the difference? <laughs> Use I me language. Fight fair. James 4, verse 1. It says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? I need this. <laughs> Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? This is true for me. It's true for you. Self-centeredness is the number one catalyst for conflict. And it's the tendency of every single one of us. <laughs> the fight isn't caused by the jerks around you but the battle within you. So fight fair. Own what's yours to own. Win the battle within before you start the war between. And guess what? It's actually okay to disagree. You're allowed to disagree. Just don't be disagreeable. 
You can disagree with your spouse. Did you know that? Here's a line from Pastor Rick Warren I find really helpful, especially with your spouse. You don't need to see eye to eye, but you must be hand in hand. So to help with fighting fair, because a lot of the times our relationship conflict, maybe it's between a spouse or something like that. To help us fight fair, I want to give us some words to erase. These are out of bounds, fouls for fighting fair. No threats. Don't threaten divorce. Don't play around with those words. Don't threaten withholding love. Intimacy is never to be weaponized. It's one thing to set healthy boundaries. It's another thing to sever bonds. Threats sever bonds. Out of bounds. No threats when we fight fair. No malice. No manipulating the other person for them to be in a position where they owe you one. No psychologizing or confusing or intimidating them for the purpose of gaining a position. No malice. No threats. No malice. And no insults. Cheap, cheap shots, name calling, out of bounds. You, nope, out of bounds. No name calling. No speaking like negative words over somebody. Like, this is why they always leave you. You're not going to get it right. You're going to be just like your dad. Nope. Fight fair. Peacemakers, fight fair. No threats, no malice, no insults. How do we make peace? We go first, we fight fair, and we keep focus. Keep focus. You can have reconciliation without resolution. Most of our conflict, it isn't even about the thing we're fighting about. It's not about the garbage being left out again. It's not about your credit card bill being too high again. It's not about them stealing and pitching your idea at work again. It's about the thing beneath the thing. So we keep focus. There's a higher way. Focus on reconciliation, not simply resolution. Win the person, not the argument. We get to show up as peacemakers and live with resurrection hope because we actually have it. Colossians 4, 6 says this about keeping focus. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Peacemakers, we go first. We fight fair. We keep focus. Making peace is more about pulling the kingdom down on earth as it is in heaven, more than pulling opposites in conflict together. It's about declaring good news over debating bad news. Here's all of today in a nutshell. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, he has committed to you, the message of reconciliation. The message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so Mission Church, this is a timely one and a tough one in the conflict that we're living in. And I implore you and myself, as God's word speaks to us, be reconciled to God. Participate in reconciliation. Declare good news over debating bad news. Be a peacemaker. Because blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And we can most make peace 
when we remember our reconciliation. It always goes back to the beginning. So today we're going to end with communion. We're going to remember. And so you pick those up on your way and you can hold those elements now. Peacemakers, we remember our reconciliation. We remember how Jesus made peace with God on your behalf. In the tension of relationship and rights, on your worst day, on my worst day, when we held a fighting posture, Jesus positioned himself on the cross and his body broken for yours. His blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins and to be reconciled to make peace between you and God. And so we're going to remember. We're going to be reconciled again. And the band is going to play this song. And as they do, um, you can open up and you can receive the bread as the band plays on your own. And you can drink the juice as the band plays this song. Be a peacemaker. Declare good news over debating bad news. As the band plays, you can receive communion now.
invite you to stand as we pray. God, thank you so much for the gift of what it looks like to live out heaven here on earth. We're so grateful, God, that we have an example in Jesus of what it looks like to be a peacemaker, to be the kind of person who loves others well, who loves others above ourselves. God, I pray that we can be that peacemaker in every area of our lives. Thank you for the example set by heaven and set by Jesus. It's in his name we pray all these things. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this week. I pray that you'll join us next week as well. Go and be peacemakers. We are mission. Thanks so much for tuning in to this message from Summer on the Mount. We pray that it helps you in your journey in finding and following Christ. As always, we would love to meet you on a Sunday morning at Mission Church. And until next time, we are Mission.